So I'm currently stuck in hospital with a somewhat rare condition called CIDP, uh, which stands for Chronic Inflammatory Demyelinating Polyneuropathy. And I thought I would record this to say how I got here. So, sometime beginning of 2023, January, February, um, I woke up with a somewhat persistent pain in my calf, my left calf, that seemed to be isolated to a particular point and very odd. Um, and I noticed that the strength in my left leg where the pain was, was slightly less than normal and less than my right leg. So when I walked downstairs, it felt like I was limping, even though I wasn't. Um, so my thoughts were blood clots. So talk to the GP, get a referral for an ultrasound, go and look for blood clots in my leg, find nothing. And then a few days later, the pain went away. And... Um, but a bit later, a few days, weeks, uh, the uh, asymmetry in my leg strength seemed to be become symmetric, that my other leg lost a similar amount of strength. So uh, I noticed initially that um, it was taking me more effort to um, climb up and down to the beach on our property which is about 80 meters vertical and a quite steep terrain with rocks and uh, uh, steps and nonsense like that and then it was difficult for me to get up from a squat so I was washing the dog I, I couldn't just squat and get up I'd kneel and you know, progressively over um, a few weeks it get more difficult to get up from a kneel that I'd have to think about it, figure out where to put my other uh, foot or possibly push off on something of not just the ground. So I talked to the GP again and I think I may have had some blood tests, I forget. Um, you know, a few weeks later, getting a bit worse, talked to GP again and got a referral to an internal, internal medicine, medicine specialist who the GP thought had some expertise in this kind of area. Um, so I went to see him, probably more blood tests. Uh, it noticed that my reflexes, like for a patella hammer, were low. Um, not as, as big a reflex as someone else would have if you hit them on the elbow. Um, so, at some point in there, I'd had, uh, I started thinking that it's something to do with nerves. And I had an uh, x ray of the spine to see if there were trapped nerves associated with my legs. As, nothing shows up there and then uh, I'd had referral to some kind of surgeon or somebody wanted to do a biopsy on my stomach to look at something that was obtained in fat and uh, I was expecting a needle biopsy and uh, instead they plunged a scalpel into my stomach which was a bit unexpected and unpleasant but um, bearable. I think that it's pretty much healed up now oh. altogether. Um, so a bit later, a bit after that, I got a referral to a neurologist who is doing more um, reflex tests and testing my strength in different activities, you know, pushing, pulling against his hands, and stuff like that. 
um, this was around, I think, end of August 2023, uh, by which time I noticed that my general strength was also being affected. You know, I could not pick up a full sheet of three-quarter inch ply, for instance. Something like that, as having more trouble lifting a, um, a planer or a couple of car batteries or something like that. Um, so he then um, was doing some nerve conduction tests where he's um, using uh, what I refer to as the dog sapper which is very, very similar to uh, our training collar for our dog. That you push a button and it sends a jolt between a couple of electrodes to uh, time um, the nerve impulses down my arms and legs by zapping them higher up and putting electrodes on the far end, measuring the, uh, the time and um, uh, amplitude and so on. Uh, it also done a, a slightly more invasive test of uh, uh, sticking a needle into the into my muscles and using the zapper to create an impulse. Um, oh yeah, and, and asking me to you know move my arms, and then you could uh, hear on a loudspeaker the nerve impulses in the muscle. So it's actually. A very very fine needle that hardly hurts at all. It's this weird sort of feeling to see somebody pushing this needle like an inch and a half into your leg and it doesn't really hurt. Um, so we then had a preliminary diagnosis. I don't think it was quite CIDP at that point and um, at some point I got follow-up I think and then there was a diagnosis of actual CIDP and one of the effective treatments for that was IVIG which is a, um, a manufactured blood, blood product basically consisting of antibodies collected from the blood services from hundreds of people so it's concentrated antibodies and um, this point, I was getting su uh, substantially weaker and getting getting difficult to do things like pick up a gallon of milk or get something down from a, a shelf above my head at, and at home. Um, and I'd gone. Yeah, I I think. And it got started to get <clears throat> weak enough that I couldn't easily do normal activities. And we went into uh, the uh, local hospital, which is in Victoria, emergency department, and got these bits of paper and diagnosis and usual thing, wait around to be triaged and got admitted and then got uh, two treatments of IVIG. Uh, I think it was two two grams per kilo of body weight. And after two or three days um, after that, there was a substantial recovery. It was like a miracle drug, you know. Throw away your, your cut crutches and walk out of here. So <clears throat> I'd gone back home. I was going up and down to the beach a couple of times and I was then supposed to get uh, follow-up treatments about a month apart at uh, Jubilee Hospital on an outpatient basis, but the scheduling and availability of the drugs meant that they didn't schedule me for follow-up for until about, I think, seven weeks instead of four. Um, anyway, after about six six and a half weeks I think I got substantially weaker again and um, I was back to the hospital for again another treatment in, in the hospital 
which was fairly effective again but not quite as effective as the first time and oh somewhere in there um, I got uh, COVID um, which didn't really seem to affect me particularly much I'd had you know, all the uh, vaccinations and boosters um, but I felt it was kind of masking the, the weakness that so was the weakness COVID was it this other thing it's getting a bit hard to tell um, anyway so after the second treatment um, again I started <coughs> getting weaker again to, um, <coughs> point um, something like three weeks I think three and a half weeks um, back again to the hospital more treatment I forget now whether I had three or four IVIG treatments but they were having progressively less effect and about a month ago I'd um, come in again and got a one, one gram per kilo um, follow-up dose of IVIG which had very little effect really um, and at that point um, yeah the last when I when I come that a uh, couple of days before coming in I was um, starting to have trouble walking and when I finally oh and going upstairs and so on so I spent a couple of nights on the main floor at home in a bed and then decided you know I should go back to the hospital and so at that point we'd rented a, a, a walker and a commode and odd things so I was able to walk around the house with a, with a walker um, so earlier I'd been having difficulty getting up off of a regular chair or a regular toilet but um, I was able to put blocks on my dining room chair to make it easier I was able to sit on a stool and we got uh, raised toilets at home so with grab bars and so on so you now I'm still able to function mostly normally but um, by the time I decided to go into hospital um, I had to have a couple of people help me to get into the car and uh, a couple of nurses at the hospital to pull me out again whereas you know, prior to that I'd been able to you know, lever myself out with just one person holding my arm or something so uh, yeah it had been getting steadily weaker since then and uh, so for a while I was um, you know, lying in bed able to um, use a computer mouse so I could for instance use a virtual keyboard to uh, type on a computer and run a web browser and do most most things um, play videos or whatever um, and then over a course of you know, next week or something I was gradually getting less uh, function in my hand so that I was reduced from being able to use all three buttons properly to possibly only one or only if somebody put my hand exactly over the mouse um, so then around then the um, IVIG had started to kick in and I got regained some ability to lift my hands up and um, roll over in bed and uh, so on but it basically wore off again um, I then switched to the, an alternate therapy which is rituximab um, I think some of these things were on Wikipedia um, but you know this doesn't have 
such an immediate effect. It's supposed to be possibly four to eight weeks. So I've been uh, lying in, in the bed here, um, sort of gradually losing the ability to move anything very much at all. And um, starting to have what seemed to be a recurrence of my childhood uh, um, breathing issues related to um, uh, allergies, I guess, and uh, bronchitis and stuff. That, so, you know, when I was you know, 10, 12, whatever it was, be sneezing every day pretty much. I was allergic to a whole bunch of pollens and dust and cats and uh, I was allergic to London which is kind of interesting is that if I'd visited London for a trip to see you know go to a show or just buy stuff in shops I would sneeze the whole next day so that's pretty much been gone from my life for the past 60 years have 50 years but uh, I, I getting um yeah, nasal secretions or something that is uh, uh, causing me to collect phlegm that I have to uh, spit up somehow. Um, so I've also lost the ability to cough properly or sneeze or blow my nose. So um, it's getting a bit difficult to, to cough up phlegm, for example. And... Uh, also lost some ability to swallow so that um, it gets more difficult to, to eat food and particularly be really careful about portion sizes and what exactly is going down my throat and uh, uh, occasionally get these sort of coughing cycles where something's really itchy and I try to cough and can't complete the cough and you know, uh, natural reaction to stop breathing during this cough, which um, means I have to uh, for bypass the reaction to not breathe, purposefully keep breathing, hope that this cough cycle goes away. Um, so, yeah, getting more difficult. Um, so, uh, now I've got um, an air bed here with a, um, a really quiet um, compressor that keeps that inflated which is um, helps prevent pressure sores since I can't move and also cy cycles through eight, every eight minutes it sort of does little micro adjustments with inflating alternate cells to provide a bit of movement but um, Yeah, and um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I find if I if I go to sleep on my back, then I can get the, a rather large amount of phlegm building up, which is difficult to clear. So I've been trying to sleep on my side as I would normally at home, but um, have to have somebody position me exactly right with a, a big pad behind my back and uh, get my arms aligned properly and my legs adjusted so that they're not rubbing on each other so they're pointing in the right direction and got a pillow between them or something and try and arrange that my body isn't twisted which is quite tricky to get um, get that all arranged and uh, seem to wake up after about four hours and uh, then get someone to uh, tip me onto the other side and then maybe wake up another three hours later and get um, fixed up in bed with it propped up so that I'm awake and <coughs> can then more easily clear phlegm and I got this here suction thing here running so I can spit phlegm into it to be disposed of instead of just 
spitting it randomly onto my beard. Um, we got, yeah, in the background, the red things, the collection of all my spit, huh, getting a bit grubby again. Um, the, on the other side over there, there's a, a call bell that I can trigger with my head to um, call somebody to do things. Um, mostly they come, sometimes there's a delay. Um, all the, the staff here are you know, really nice and helpful, just there uh, isn't really enough of them, which is common to yes, the whole health service. Um, oh, and I'm still eating solid food, more or less, but uh, need somebody to feed me each time. Um, I had trouble swallowing physically larger things that I can't chew, like you know, pearl barley, for example, in, in a barley beef soup, or um, I started off able to chew up sandwiches, but that's getting a bit difficult. Um, but it depends on the consistency of what it is after I've actually chewed it, so um, helps to have gravy or sauce with things. Um, some of the, the dietary choices were a bit weird because they, they were still giving me a, a rather overdone cheese omelette, which I could, last time I tried, I could actually eat, but I have to be really careful to chew them into small bits. Um, yeah, anyway, just had Christmas in the hospital with my family come round and bought some real food and presents and so forth, which is very pleasant. And I'm basically waiting to see if this rituximab does actually have some positive benefit and we'll reverse this. And other possibilities are riskier drugs with more side effects or possibly a plasma exchange process which is rather like kidney dialysis except um, they only offer that in Vancouver which would be I mean a transfer and more difficult for my family to visit so at the moment we're still hoping that the rituximab would have some effect um, as far as technology goes, I have voice activation turned on on my Android phone, which is a, a built-in feature, I think. I don't, feel, don't remember we had to download anything. Um, it's pretty good, but frustratingly not perfect. So I can basically bring up an overlay of numbered dots on top of the typical app or, or app list and then say the number to make something happen. So I can say um, open Firefox or um, open Quora or um, scroll down, scroll right. Um, some of the pages and apps work a lot better than others and occasionally the dots get misaligned, sometimes completely misaligned, sometimes absolutely crazy. There's one cartoon site I'd like to visit where the dots just go haywire. It shows like 200 dots on the screen. It's mad. Um, some of the apps seem to work better than than uh, the equivalent web page. So there's a, an app for the Guardian newspaper, for instance. There's a, an app for a new scientist. There's a, an app for CBC radio. I had an interesting uh, experience trying to play music. Where I'd uh, started a music player and played one of the songs in my uh, music folder and then found I couldn't stop it because uh, 
it, it wouldn't listen to me while the music was playing. The microphone just didn't pick my voice up. So I had to get somebody to stop it. Um, so I've now got, uh, I've got a couple of headsets with the microphone and they work a bit better in the that at least I can stop music play. Um, but there seems to be no input gain control on the, the phone, or at least on the particular headsets I have. Um, I had hoped that a boom microphone would be more sensitive to my voice if it's right in front of my face, but didn't seem to be quite that good. I still have to talk relatively loud to activate the phone and the phone is also of course more sensitive to female voices at higher frequency like coming across the other side of the room so that sometimes there's you know, something that somebody else says will hijack my phone and uh, cause it to do odd things but um, as I say much much better than nothing um, We'd also got uh, a laptop with Windows 11, which now has voice activation for the system commands. So in theory, the same as the phone, in practice, virtually useless, because it seems to be, there seem to be so many things that just trigger something on the, the system. Like if you say any sentence with the word start in it, it pops up a a start menu on top of what you were trying to do um, and or uh, some random pop-up appears from an uh, antivirus saying you know please subscribe but just being able to click an X by voice is in fact I don't know how to do it it just didn't seem half so good as the Android but the other issue on the Android is to actually trying to enter text because even if it does quite a good job, you, you then uh, try to exit the dictation mode and if it misinterprets the command you use to get out of it, then you just get more and more junk building up. Um, for instance, if there's junk, in theory I can say select all and then cut, but in practice half the time it mangles it or it doesn't understand cut or delete isn't available so I'd pretty much given up on that. A um, couple of times I was able to use the, the Google microphone thing on the home screen to do a search like it worked like twice or something. Um, I was able to get to Project Gutenberg for example and then quickly bookmark it before it had disappeared so I'm just about able to access bookmarks in Firefox through the, the numbering scheme of the drop down list um, so I've been reading some ebooks on Gutenberg and again the web pages are occasionally weird um, if I had the numbers um, they don't always line up with the links on the page, so very confusing. But there's an alternate scheme to draw a grid on the screen and then select one of 32 grids, 32 cells in a grid, and um, then zoom in to another one of nine cells in smaller cells, and then that's pretty good chance that's an active area. So. I was able to navigate web pages like that, which is uh, slightly trickier as it doesn't often doesn't understand the command hide grid. Um, and uh, <coughs> so I tried. I eventually found a an e-reader that uh, I was able to download some books and open them in the e-reader and. In that case, it remembers where I was in the book. Um, and I can go through with scroll right. Um, whereas Firefox, typically if I come out of a book uh, to do something else, 
and go back, it goes back to the beginning of the book and saying scroll down 120 times gets very tedious. Um, yeah, so that's where I am at the moment.